Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to this video where we're going to be going through equilibrium existence proofs. So this is the case for an exchange economy. Suppose that U of H, right, where we have H many consumers is a strictly quasi-concave function over our commodity space defined by a n-dimensional positive real number space. And consumer H has an endowment defined within our commodity space, then a wall rising equilibrium exists. So this is the whole uh, theorem that we go and we have, or proposition, whatever you call it. Um, we have to acknowledge some economic facts before we go and we prove this. The first fact is going to be with reference to Walrus's law. Uh, the next fact is that only relative prices go and matter. Some people go and call this a price normalization theorem. And the next one is Brouwer's fixed point theorem, which simply says that if we have a closed and bounded function, right? If we have uh, our function evaluated at some point x bar, it will spit out a point x bar. So to prove this, step number one is that we're going to normalize our prices to be on the n dimension unit simplex. Note that only relative prices go and matter. So this here is going to be the symbol for our unit simplex, and this is going to be p, right? Remember p here, right, is just a price vector, right? It's not, you know, any price, it's a vector of prices such that our price vector, that means each element in our prices is greater than or equal to zero, and that the sum of all these elements is equal to one. Step number two is that we're going to define a mapping which determines our price dynamics, right? We're going to pick a mapping. That's it. So that is just going to be G of P, right, is equal to P, all plus the excess demand, right, in a particular market or our vector of uh, excess demands. Remember, these are, you know, we're adding two vectors here all over, right, this down here, which is a scalar, right, where this zj plus, right, that is just maintaining that our excess demand, right, in each market is going to be uh, either, you know, the value that it goes and spits out or it's going to be zero. So we could have uh, positive excess demand in individual markets, but just that when we sum them over together, right, they're going to be equal to zero. Step number two, you know, continued right here, is that we have to go and think about this. So we're going to note that, again, this is, we were talking about the world of vectors, right? And we're going to understand why, you know, this is our appropriate mapping that we go and we want. We're going to first refine this to be, mean the following, right? We're going to define PJ hat is equal to PJ, right? And likewise, if we just put a summation sign in front of it, we get the following. And this corresponds to our numerator and denominator in our mapping, which goes and brings us down to this here, right? And this is a natural way to go and normalize our prices. Another fact that we're going to have to note is about the nature of our excess demand equations, right? This should have been, you know, put in the facts section but from beforehand, but, you know, these are, you know, pretty obvious relationships, that being, if as price goes and approaches zero, our excess demand will go and tend to infinity. And if our prices go to infinity, our excess demand will go to zero. So step number three is that we're gonna qualify uh, our analysis. So we're gonna restrict our analysis to a finite commodity space because we can't just go right to our fixed point theorems right away. So what we're gonna go and say is that our Omega, which is going to be our feasible set, right, is going to be our vector of household demands such that our demands are between zero, right, and, you know, some multiple of this household's initial endowment, right? Thus, our households are able to go and solve, you know, the standard utility maximization problem. And since U of H, right, this is quasi concave, right, we have a unique solution here. Now, moving forward, right, with a pr our final step in our proof, we go and we appeal to Brouwer's fixed point theorem and we abuse our mapping, right? We're going to go and say that there exists uh, some P here on our unit simplex, right? Because we have, you know, two points here, right? We have a correspondence which is closed and bounded, right, as determined by our utility maximizing uh, consumer. And we have this mapping lying on there, right? So we can say that such a value P or such a vector P, right, is going to be a fixed point, right? Now, 
one thing that we should note is that if, once we proved a fixed point, right, we have proved an equilibrium existence. But let's just go and uh, say something, right, because we've only said that, you know, something very bold that our prices have to be uh, strictly positive here. So what's up with that? So let's suppose that we have um, a price, right, on some market J that's equal to zero, and that's a fixed point, right? What's going to go and happen? Um, if we go and we have that, and we go and we plug in our value zero, so we just knock out uh, this point here, uh, we end up, you know, with a little bit of a problem situation, right? Because z j plus, right, as a function of p, right? If p is going to be equal to zero, right, or if that price is going to be equal to zero, this is going to be, you know, very big. It's going to be greater than zero, right? And if we have something greater than zero over one, right, this is also going to be greater than zero, which is a contradiction, right? Thus, we say that p being equal to zero or pj being equal to zero, right, is not a fixed point. The next thing I want to go and talk about to go and just really drive the point home about uh, having a fixed point means that we have an equilibrium is that we're going to look at a subset of markets and we're going to suppose that you know, in the subset of markets, you know, excess demand is greater than zero, right? This is, you know, A-OK -okay because we just, you know, say that uh, if it sums over all markets, right, it's going to be equal to zero. But if we look at a subset, it could be positive. OK, that's fine, right? So we're going to be restricting our analysis to the price vectors there, right, which, you know, from our definitions is just less than one. It follows from our definitions of our correspondence. If we just go and rearrange this thing, um, we get down to this step right here right as in this it shouldn't be uh you know so crazy uh to go and show how you could do this algebra but we get down here if we go and we run the summation operator over all i right in our subset right big i right we end up with a problem so if we look at uh this thing right we note that this here right this is going to be equal to zero right because that's what we go and we have. And if that's equal to zero, we have PIs equal to one, right? Thus, Walrus's law holds in each market. Now, you might be a little bit, you know, confused here saying like, how does this prove that this here sums up to one? Remember, PI, right, is effectively like a weight, right? And if this is, if this is true, right, if this is true, then we, and we can go and, you know, rearrange, you know, these prices here, right? Such that we're able to go and increase uh, our demand. That's what it seems like we can do. However, our sum total of demands uh, go and equal to zero. So this is how it really works. So if you go and you think about it in terms of how each P here is like a weight and we can't go and shuffle these weights such that we're able to go and end up in a situation with excess demand, uh, that's how um, we go and we prove this. So what we've learned here is that we can use our fixed point theorems to go and prove equilibrium existence and why exactly a fixed point is a equilibrium here. I hope this video helps. I will see you in the next one. Take care.